The history of math is our intellectual foundation to understanding science. Science, beautiful, awesome, wonderful science. It's the creative foundation to our ineffable future. Hi, I'm Gabrielle Burchak, and this is my podcast, Math, Science, History. a resident of Los Angeles, I often find myself stuck in traffic. And believe it or not, I really do love traffic. As a bookaholic, it gives me the chance to listen to my books on Audible. Did you know that when you sign up at Audible, you get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial? You can sign up at www.audibletrial.com slash math science history and choose from over 180,000 titles for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. So many wonderful books to explore the wonders of math, science, and history. Well, the holidays are over, and with a lot of catching up to do, I've decided to do a podcast about a research project that I've undertaken for the last three, almost four years now. I'm going to talk about the mathematics professor, philosopher, and astronomer Hypatia of Alexandria. Hypatia lived in Alexandria, Egypt in the 4th and 5th centuries as a mathematician and philosopher. However, she is most famous for the way in which she died. On March 8, 415, Hypatia was murdered. She was leaving her place of lecture, which might have been the archaeological area that is now known as Com Eldica. She was on her chariot when a mob of angry church members under the influence of Alexandria's Pope Cyril ripped her away from her carriage. They then stripped her of her clothing and then skinned her while she was alive. They ripped her apart limb to limb. Then the angry mob carried her limbs to the Cineron, which was located near the Caesarium, where they burned every last trace of her. It was a horribly tragic death that not only brings a level of shock to the current reader, but it also shocked Alexandria at that time. You see, Hypatia was loved by Alexandria. There are many myths about her reputation, but the truth is she was honored and appreciated by the diverse citizens of Alexandria, the government, and the church. Many people believe that Hypatia's murder was actually the end of scientific development in Alexandria. The stories that circulate on the internet say that this was when the great library was burnt to the ground. However, that's not the case. The library had been in decay for hundreds of years before Hypatia was even born in Alexandria. And this decay is actually noted by the ancient renowned historian by the name of Strabo. But back to Hypatia, she was quite an accomplished mathematician. Her father, Theon, was also a mathematician and he trained her to follow in his footsteps. She was so good at what she did that academics and historians who lived near that time wrote about her intellect and how she actually surpassed her father in aptitude. It's noted in historical works, and it's actually been extensively researched, that she worked on many commentaries. Now, back then, commentaries were considered to be like workbooks and supplements to the original scientific publications. So, she worked on commentaries that included Archimedes' dimension of a circle, Euclid's Elements, Diophantus's Arithmetica, Apollonius's Conics, as well as isoparametric surfaces and curved surfaces. Possibly she worked on many more. It's unfortunate that almost all of her work does tangibly not exist in our current time. However, many incredible historians, including Wilbur Knorr and Adolphe Rome, have conducted extensive research showing how some of her work had been copied and built upon by scholars that came after her. So her work did live on. Hypatia was a pagan philosopher who taught Neoplatonism. She was also an astronomer who worked with astrolabes and wrote excerpts for the Almagest, which was a grand mathematical tome that assists in charting the stars. So her murder actually ties to these key pieces. 
There are stories that Hypatia was a witch who used astrolabes and beguiled the governor of Alexandria. This is not true. The whole story about her being a witch actually comes from propaganda that was perpetuated by the church hundreds of years after her death. And ironically, this propaganda coincided with the canonizing of Cyril of Alexandria. The story is this. Hypatia was a beloved philosopher who taught Neoplatonism. At this time, there were two prominent philosophies in Alexandria. One was Neoplatonism, which, for the sake of time, focused on developing a single relationship with a single spiritual entity. The other prominent philosophy being taught in Alexandria at that time was Iamblicanism. It was a philosophy that actually utilized the sacrifices of animals. It would be like the difference between Judaism and metaphysics. Her role as a philosopher and government advisor was honored by Alexandria. She was so loved by academic circles and the people of Alexandria that when government leaders and elites would visit the city, they would actually visit her first out of honor. In her classroom and in evening meetings with her disciples, she exemplified the importance of tolerance. The church didn't hate her, nor did she dislike the church. As a matter of fact, she was a public professor and had a diverse student body that traveled from far distances to come and learn from her. Some of her students were devoted pagans others were dedicated Christians, and others were honorable Jews. So her lessons had created the perfect platform to incorporate a relationship with God into philosophy, and it worked absolutely perfect for her. So at this point, she had no qualms with the church. As a matter of fact, when she was a burgeoning professor just starting to take over her father's school, she had garnered an alliance with the then Pope of Alexandria, Theophilus. Theophilus valued her contribution to Alexandria so much that he even resided over the marriage of one of her disciples, Synesius. However, Theophilus grew old and passed away. Then his nephew forced his way into the position. This was Cyril. Cyril didn't ascend to the throne. As a matter of fact, his uncle had taken away some of his church privileges months before he passed away. But Cyril manipulated his way into the position of the Pope of Alexandria. There was pushback by a group of Christians who wanted another person, Bishop Timothy, as their Pope. This group saw Cyril as an iron-fisted leader. Cyril was not a good guy, and he was the one person who hated her so much that even historians of this time recognized it. The Suda notes his jealousy, and other historians, such as Damascius, wrote about his jealousy of Hypatia in his work called The Life of Isidore. It was shortly after Cyril became pope that Hypatia became an advisor to Orestes, who was the new governor of Alexandria. Also around this time, there had been a lot of infighting between the different on Claves of Alexandria, and even though there had been fighting between the Jews and the Christians and the Christians and the pagans, the government and the church were able to keep peace in the city. However, there was one particular day when everything started to go south. To make a long story short, Orestes and Cyril had been at odds with each other. There had been complaints about the loud Jewish Sabbath celebrations that were held on Saturdays. It was Orestes's job to maintain peace in the city. However, he didn't want to prohibit the celebrations. He wanted them to continue to maintain peace. This might have been advice from Hypatia in order to maintain tolerance in Alexandria. So, on the day that he announced this allowance in the theater, Cyril's subordinate, Hyrax, was in the theater heckling Orestes. Orestes had Hyrax arrested and tortured, which infuriated Cyril, who ordered that the Jews be punished. The Jewish community of Alexandria refused to be manipulated by Cyril, and so they arranged to have a street battle with the Christians. So, a day after this, Cyril encouraged his parishioners to enter the Jewish synagogues, apprehend the Jews, and expel them from Alexandria. This move actually depleted a large portion of Alexandria. Cyril then tried to manipulate Orestes into reconciling with him, which would actually tip the scales of power to the church. Orestes didn't want this. It wouldn't bode well for the diverse community of Alexandria, and Orestes knew it. 
the infuriated Cyril decided to command his Nitrian monks who lived outside of the city to come in and attack Orestes, which they did. This infighting continued between Cyril and Orestes, and Cyril really felt threatened by Hypatia's advisory role to Orestes. And so, from the pulpit, Cyril encouraged the Nitrian monks and his parishioners to harass her. But the harassment went too far, and they murdered her. Many people believe that this was the end of Neoplatonism. However, it wasn't. It was only the end of Hypatia's Neoplatonism. It was the end of a tolerant community empowered by a like-minded philosophy that encouraged tolerance and peace in Alexandria. And so after her murder, philosophy evolved into something that was a bit more suspicious and divisive. Philosophers began to immigrate out of Alexandria and go to Constantinople and Athens. Many philosophers tried to follow in Hypatia's footsteps. However, many were unsuccessful. She had established a school of education and philosophy that could never be duplicated in Alexandria again. Hypatia left a tremendous impression on Alexandria and in the world, because we're talking about her today. She was also horribly missed among the leaders in the government and in the church, so much so that within a year after her murder, the Roman emperor Theodosius II established an edict to place restrictions on Cyril's activity and prohibit him from ordering his parishioners to carry out his deeds. What made this edict incriminating was that Cyril was named in this mandate. Hypatia literally gave her life to be a professor. To me, the story reflects the people who become academics and professors and who commit their entire lives to learning and then teaching in order to make this world a smarter place. The only way we can create an intelligent planet is to diligently learn, inclusively share, and optimistically hope that we can perpetuate our own personal inspirations. Inspiration is the the most powerful legacy, and I know this firsthand from my own professors and advisors who I am so grateful for. So, to set the false stories straight, Hypatia was not a witch, nor did she beguile men to do her biddings. She was an amazing professor, a philosopher, and a mathematician. She was loved by the city, by the government, and by the church. The story of her life is really an amazing one. Her contributions to mathematics and astronomy were extensive, and the philosophies that she taught her disciples lived on. Hypatia was a gallant martyr. She was a defender for academia, she was a role model for mathematics, and she was a Neoplatonic saint. But mostly, for all that she did in her lifetime, Hypatia was a champion for tolerance. I'm Gabrielle Burchak. This podcast has been brought to you by Caffeine. Delicious, wonderful, nectar of the gods caffeine. Coffee, tea, coffee candy, you name it. I love it. Thank you for listening to Math Science History. If you are interested in reading more about the history of math and science, please come visit me at mathsciencehistory.com. And... While you are there, if you like what you're listening to, please feel free to click on that coffee button and buy me a cup of coffee. Until next week, carpe diem!